translations to pick up the, the change. Because, you know, it will be to conflict of interest for me at some point, probably in 2018. But until the change happens, there will then have to be two shadow things running. There will have to be a new partnership being developed. And until it is real and alive, the board will have to continue. So we could be in for a fairly busy 15, 18 minutes or so, we think. But we will keep you as posted as we can keep you as to, as to where this is all going. And all the partner organisations as well, it's really important. Okay, so. uh, we're going to move on. Uh, we've agreed at the last committee to monitor the changes to safeguard and arrangements closely. Uh, an email was sent out by, uh, about the Christmas meal as well, so if anyone has anything to contribute to that, please get in touch. Can I just ask about the
So in terms of this report, members are asked to support the recommendation. I'm sorry, I'll come to that afterwards. In terms of background information, um, the pledge is one of 20 pledges. It was very clear from the partnership uh, work that took place across all of those uh, um, uh, agencies across the world uh, that there was very much a wish um, to, to drive out uh, domestic abuse from our, from our uh, area um, and, and one of the pledges talked about zero tolerance to that domestic abuse and those harmful practices. The pledge has been up and running now for uh, 18 months coming into two years and what was identified through a number of workshops with fantastic, I have to say, absolutely fantastic representation across not only the statutory services, which you might expect, but also in terms of domestic abuse. Whittled is really, really well served by a, a, a host of third sector organisations that are very strong in their own rights, but actually came forward as part of the partnership and are part of our solutions in terms of dealing with that, and are very much part of the integrated approach to how we're trying to tackle the, this issue across Whittle. In terms of the, uh, the pledge itself, it was a five-year pledge and we're only 18 months into it and what was uh, clearly identified and is backed up by empirical evidence nationally is that there is a whole uh, large amount of domestic abuse that goes on without any reporting and there's lots of statistics from Safer Lives and organisations of that nature that you can look up and, uh, and will show that. So it was felt very much the pledge that at the front end of it, we wanted to do a lot of work about increasing the awareness of domestic abuse and harmful practices. And with that comes a risk, well, well actually, probably an outcome as, as the group wanted, which is an increase in numbers of reports that domestic abuse actually occurring, which is quite adverse to some of the other things where we're trying to drive down targets, but it's felt in those first couple of years which we put into towards that. The scope and definition I've left in there, it's a, it's a national definition for uh, domestic abuse and harmful practices that, we, that we've adopted and it, there's a little bit into, uh, in terms of section 5.1 about some national statistics about uh, how, how uh, domestic abuse is, is, is across all ranges of society and uh, survivors and victims come across all areas of society. However, it is predominantly a, a, a male on female issue and 97% on rural of cases that come in as high risk cases into our statutory um, assessment. Uh, the MARAC are, are actually um, uh, male on female domestic violence. Um, underpinning the, the, uh, uh, the action plan in terms of the pledge, there is however recognition that all genders across the uh, uh, community do suffer from some parts uh, uh, domestic abuse, domestic violence, and in fact we did a strategic needs analysis some three years ago to try and direct us in terms of the work we should be looking at. And some of those uh, uh, groups in, in our communities um, we just didn't get the, uh, the ability to drill down into those because they were classed as within that strategic needs analysis harder to reach groups. And, and I was saying that some of those come from uh, the LBGT community, but also more worryingly nowadays, it's very much around the BAME communities and the, 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 the ethnic communities that we have. And it's an interesting statistic, and one we're challenging within the domestic abuse group now is that within Wirral, uh, that there, there are some um, um, members of our communities where there have been no reported domestic abuse cases and I use communities such as uh, the Chinese community and the Far Eastern community and we, we don't think that can be the case for partnership and we're actually working with Real Change and organisations to see if we can drill down into that and find out why that is the case. So I just, I just, I just offer that up that there as a, a piece of work still to be done on that insight. I've attached a table in Appendix 1 that details the MARAC, so in terms of the governance for domestic abuse, again, utilising the integrated front door, that if there is anybody in this room that is uh, concerned about a domestic abuse situation that's taking place, if it's taking place immediately and you hear that, then you need to bring 999 and report that into the police. If it's something around the safeguarding or some concern, then you can feed that into the integrated front door and that will be investigated as well. But I've put in, in terms of that, if it is a case, it comes into our MARAC, our Multi-Agency Risk Assessment Conference. Our MARAC is very well supported by all agencies and again, they look at the cases that have been triaged as high risk. 
and know in those high risk cases there, there is appropriate actions placed against those by the professionals around those meetings to ensure that the, uh, the, the, the victim and, and the victim's family are protected against that perpetrator and if necessary that those type of situations can lead to hardening of properties, CCTV locks and things of that nature. But what we do rely upon, and this is often one of the complexities of domestic abuse, is we rely upon um, the, the partner or the survivor or the victim to report and be willing to report in and support the actions being taken against the perpetrator in that setting, because otherwise it's very difficult to push that forward. In terms of the, the, the statistics there, though, I've left you a course or two position report that 51 uh, per 10,000 population of high risk cases uh, of Wirral uh, are high risk cases of Wirral, whereas safer lives nationally say Wirral should only be experienced 40 cases. So we think this increase in numbers for us is actually more a success of our campaign and our advertising to be out there to tell people they can report it and things will be looked at. And, and, and I, I, I absolutely accept that that's probably still only scratching the surface of a lot of abuse and a lot of harmful practices are going on in, in people's houses. The other bit, and because of the link to this committee, I was very uh, uh, interested to put out there, it, it has been mentioned in Ofsted reporting, etc., is that there are also 1,267 children were present in the house where high risk domestic violence or abuse cases were reported. And what's very clear is there's lots of, again, empirical and national evidence that, so, that shows that children that are in situations where domestic violence is taking place around them, they will, they have a high percentage or high, uh, high chance of actually becoming um, domestic violence perpetrators themselves as they move through life. So again, very important we look with uh, to try and address those issues. Some of the achievements to date are listed into section uh, six. Uh, we, we laid the plan out against the four P's. It was very much a case when we first set this up that the domestic abuse uh, um, uh, program and processes were very much led from a police directive and that's very much their way of going forward. There's already been uh, uh, conversations within the domestic abuse group that actually we should now start reviewing that at two year points and actually moving that away from those four P's because it doesn't necessarily fit with totally what we want to do in terms of that. But I mentioned the first part of that was about prevention and early intervention, and we've there's listed there some of those highlights around the branding, the zero tolerance campaign. We worked with um, uh, Tramia Rovers, being fantastic in supporting us around taking part in three matches, and they're doing it again. So uh, 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 dedicating a match this year. We participated in the Champs Be a Lover Not a Fighter campaign, the public health campaign, and we, we sponsored two fire engines going around. And, and we've launched um, uh, the Home Office campaign, disrespecting nobody, uh, direct, specific directed towards young people um, from becoming perpetrators and victims of abusive relationships. So, very much a drive to try and increase the awareness of domestic abuse across the, across the, uh, across the world. Uh, in addition to the marketing and advertisement, however, we've also looked at um, addressing what, again, some of the concerns that Maggie made, that as the, as the, um, the uh, budget situations in different organisations starts to uh, uh, take hold, that there is a, a need for even greater integration and working closer together. And, and so we worked very much towards this, this setting up this safe or rural hub where we could actually have co-located in one building early help, the statutory enforcement of, uh, services for the police, um, uh, a community patrol, and we've moved, logistically moved, the integrated front door service into the same building as well. And all that is intended to be a one-stop facility where all those professionals and all those agencies can see and receive all of those referrals that come in and assess them together and they don't have to go across buildings and all those things, they can actually start talking together about what they're doing to address those. So it's early days and we think that's going to achieve fantastic results for us. We also realise that no matter what we do, when, it, when you look at the figures that are there around domestic abuse, then the amount of money we would need to throw at dealing with this would be, would, be, uh, would be impossible to bring together. And what I've also alluded to is that we have some fantastic third sector organisations out there who were already in their own right 
uh, dealing with victims and survivors of domestic abuse very successfully without any statutory service having to come in and assist them and help them. But what we did do was ask them what they felt was missing in terms of that pathway uh, for, for domestic abuse victims, and again, figures from, uh, 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 and statistics that come from Safe for Lives and organisations and the like will talk about. Um, Victims of domestic abuse, uh, certainly females in a family setting, uh, suffering up to 35 to 40 cases of domestic abuse before they're willing to take action because of lots of risks that they probably feel about losing their house, losing their family, etc. 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 So, what they said was missing was a resource that's out there where actually people could go to to actually talk about that without that threat maybe hanging over them that that's going to be you need to safeguard it. And that led to a peer mentor training scheme which we did with uh, Tomorrow's Women's World Involved Northwest. And that's been really, really successful in terms of training survivors in the main of domestic abuse into uh, through, through a, 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 an MVQ scheme to become peer mentors and we've now started to put those out to, into outreach services in four of our children's centres that we were talking about before. So again, mums coming into those children's centres can go and speak to somebody who's been through that, has been trained to deal with that and obviously therefore can start assisting those in terms of uh, the, the, the situation they're dealing with. We also, um, in terms of successes in the first year, it would be wrong if we didn't sit here and say that we can talk about survivors and the protection of survivors and our strategy very much within the group's wishes was very much directed towards the protection of the, the survivor, the victim and also the children of those victims, very children centric. But within all of that, there's also an element about we need to try and do something with those perpetrators. Because they will go into prison, they may come out of prison, they'll stay on license, they're forever going, and they're at risk of them going back into that relationship. So we commissioned a couple of courses, a couple of things. One, the police uh, chose Willow and Liverpool to do a trial of the integrated offender management team. So the integrated offender management team is a frontline police team with National Protection Service, and they target um, criminals across a range of categories um, to make sure that they know where they are all the time and they do searches on their properties on a regular basis to make sure they, they've got control over them as best they can. And we did a cohort of domestic abuse perpetrators. So 16 of the selected by National Probation Service coming back through the gate individuals in the main batch out of prison, they've been identified and they are being managed through this integrated offender management team and that's been running for 12 months and the reports on that seem to be very favourable in terms of repeat issues of going back to properties and back into relationships or causing more offences. So we think that's a really, a, a really good piece of work. And then the other bit we've done is we were very interested to understand how um, perpetrator um, um, uh, uh, programs were actually being effective and there's a program out there called the HELP program and when people are, are, are um, charged and, and, and arrested with domestic abuse and they go through the courts, one of the things they're offered is this HELP program and we wanted to understand whether this almost universal offer of a perpetrator's ch behaviour change program, which is in effect what it is, was actually effective across the whole plethora of the community because that was the one, the one offer, if you like. So we, we commissioned the course uh, across four separate categories. We did um, uh, young males, their, their adults are 16 and above. We did uh, uh, females and then we did two for male cohorts of slightly different ages and different backgrounds. And again, the feedback that came back from that was really, really strong. And actually, one of the most powerful things I would recommend and I will share the video through to this committee if they, if they wish, was uh, the, the, the younger males cohort. Um, they, they commissioned or they did a video as part of their work. And that was really, really powerful listening to young males talk about relationships and how they view their relationships from their upbringing in their family and actually how that course kind of then turned around and I, as I said there wasn't a dry eye in the house, I'm, I'm really not kidding, it was, it was powerful stuff. So really we're taking that forward now and actually working with uh, the community rehabilitation company about what else we can offer and what we can do around that. 
Uh, just finish off my main chair with the next steps. Uh, so next steps, we've got an updated action plan that I've appended to this report. It talks about how we're seeking to raise the awareness. I've talked about the highlights of government actions, but it also picks up what we're trying to seek awareness of. So the DFE child abuse campaign, if you think it reports it, uh, with, that we seem to be uh, having uh, an increase in what we term, what is termed as elder abuse. So this is um, uh, abuse against uh, uh, the elderly. And then we've got an, in, uh, an issue about uh, increasing statistics that we're looking into about child on parent or child on care abuse as well. So the number of reports that are coming in. But again, if you think about that setting, that's reports that are very coming in from school into the front door and are being looked at. Online and cyber abuse is a whole area, and there's a presentation going to go on at the next safeguard board that picks up some of those uh, issues, and then tr tr child criminal exploitation and sexual exploitation as well. So, uh, 7.3 talks about the need to complete a strategic needs analysis now and drill down into those targeted groups. But uh, before I go on to questions, I'd just like to leave with the recommendations of the report, um, which are for the committee to. Note the progress made in the first stages uh, uh, against the Zero Tolerance uh, uh, Pledge, endorse the next steps in the action plan, and pledge their support of the domestic abuse of rights and Zero Tolerance campaign. I'm happy to answer any questions, Chair. Okay, Moira, no, Adam. Thanks, Chair. Um, so, a couple of points I want to make. First of all, it's very interesting to listen to the narrative. Thank you very much for that. It would be helpful if we had more data that we could look at, break down into different groups that were involved on trends that are a little bit more about comparator um, or us, that kind of thing, which would be a bit more helpful than just the, the narrative. So that's one point I'd like to make. The other is on, on some of the um, performance indicators. Um, can you offer any explanation as to why the number of referrals to the Family Safety Unit has decreased by 25%? And also, something around that figure of a 26% increase of uh, young people who are um, experiencing domestic um, violence. Could you give us some sort of a, a number around what, what, what you think those reasons could be? Yeah, uh, thank you Councillor. Yeah, one of the one of the concerns was that increase in the number of reports that were into the public safety unit. Uh, and we're looking into that now to, to identify why we think that is the case. Quite a big decrease, isn't it? A quarter down. Yeah, it, yes it is. Um, yes it is. We, we think um, um, that there's been a whole host of training that's taken place around thresholds. We think there's been a whole host of training that's been taking place, of frontline training around domestic abuse and how to identify signs of it. But we, we also think that, um, that the, 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 the numbers of cases that go into the family safety unit are the high risk cases and what we didn't have previously was um, a sort of an, an earlier help offer around some of that domestic abuse. So we're actually looking now, if some of those cases come in, they're triaged at the front door, not appropriate for going straight into the family safety unit because they don't meet their thresholds in our case, but they are being picked up below. So that, it would be, it would be, well, as I said, it would be good to have some data that we can match that sort of thing, yeah. of what's happening, actually happening yeah. with domestic violence. Yeah. And also the number of children, it would indicate to me, as a, as a Yeah, 
Yeah, so they're still supporting it, and actually they've won a Home Office grant in terms of um, some increased funding for extra capacity in terms of the spaces there. So there is extra provision there in terms of that. We, we, we did a bid on City Region Bills with the Liverpool City as well to increase that provision. Sheila Jacobs from the housing side can come back and talk, but I'll get that data and feed that back to you. Okay, Adam. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, a few points from different areas. Uh, firstly, on the update, uh, just your view, really, do you think we're doing enough uh, around prevention, really? <coughs> we're looking at speaking to some businesses and we've got the, uh, the domestic abuse community champions. That seems to be more about early intervention, the fact that the champions and 30 businesses is a small number. I don't, I don't see how businesses always fit with this. So do we need to be doing more with education, uh, getting people when they do not after they've attended, when they're perpetrated, before they've attended? So that, that's the first question. Uh, the second question, you did point out the BME community <coughs> as having, maybe they're not reporting enough, but if you actually look at the figures of the numbers that have come in at the moment, given that roughly the world has about 3% BME, but they produce 5% of the referrals in that, particular period. Are we doing something as well as looking at under-reporting or actually speaking to our community to actual prevention and, and dealing with the issue? And then the third question, sorry, in a second, sorry. Uh, actually, let's think of the other Okay, so uh, uh, are we doing enough for prevention? Uh, probably not. Is, is, is the honest answer, but we are doing a, a, a lot around prevention uh, in terms of the capacity and resources we have available. So we very much have linked in uh, the, the, the community champions I mentioned there. We've also, uh, with, us, with the uh, Safer Whittle Hub, we've linked in with the community connectors and training with those. So on their door knocking, they, they have training to be able to feed it in. In terms of the fire service, they have as well. We've run a load of host of cap uh, campaigns around advertising. Um, in terms of the school side, uh, I mentioned about the perpetrator side there, but we also use some of the campaigns that are out there, which have been captured in the report about feeding those through the schools. We've done plays from the, from the, from the, from the uh, youth theatre and such like around targeted groups. The, so we, 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 we are, the offer is there in the same way that it is all the time about trying to push the offer through. Um, sometimes that's not taken on board by, by organisations in terms of schools and that they don't feel it's, it's a right fit for them. But, but that's, that's changing. That, that whole ethos is changing and we're starting to get that out in terms of that message. So that was that. In terms of the, uh, the, the, the final point around the, the, the uh, Bain communities, the BME communities, uh, very much so. So the, I mentioned about the community champions and the peer mentors. None of those were from those communities. We're working with Will Change now to get some of those peer mentors from, from, from those communities. There are um, um, a number of issues that sit within those communities themselves, um, but it's important that we continue to try and, 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 and approach those and try and offer to try and get in to understand whether there is domestic abuse taking place and if so, we do things to support those victims. Is there an opportunity to learn from best practice from other areas that have got large communities? Yeah, yeah, and again, we, that, that work is taking place. So we sit on a, a city region protecting vulnerable people forum, and we share best practice among those. There's a number. The champion of this pledge, uh, Councilman uh, Nita Reach, is very strong in that area, and is is, is out there as as council groups before. And there are other elected members, and, and sorry, councillors who will who will often get in touch with me about events that are taking place that are there. So I think there is a lot going on. But could we do more? Yes, absolutely. I think what we're trying Trying to do with the concept of the safer world hub and bringing those uh, resources all into the same building is that we 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 brought the third sector into those those buildings as well into those resources. So actually, it's it now it's not necessarily a case of well what would be the statutory service to go out and deal with that or what would be the early help of that. But there is third sector organisations who are willing to take up some of that work when appropriate. Sure. So, uh, I 
Yeah. Um, but the other point is actually the other, the other point is actually going to be on people who are socially isolated. So how are we reaching people who don't come out to community centres? Your mums who may not want to get involved in any groups, they don't have any outside contact. They're alone in the home, you know, apart from the being there. Yeah. How how are we reaching those groups? Yeah, so our, 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 our attempt to try and deal with that very difficult issue is very much by using some of these community connectors that when they're doing their door knocking campaigns, specifically around some of those health outcomes, we train them on spotting uh, signs and, and, and symptoms of domestic abuse and actually they'll be doing that door knocking and we'll get some of those from, from, from that as well and offer that service. But to continually keep to try and advertise it and in terms of some of the uh, the, the, the electronic um, websites and that are out there, they specifically have safe areas where people can go to, etc., where the history is wiped off the key and, 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 and getting those telephone numbers out there for people to know that they can do that. Thank you. Uh, do you want to Thank you. 